to walk away from him. At your church, it'll work different every time. And, and I want to say this again. This is another little house cleaning tip in case you didn't get it in my session. All your intercessors weren't in here yesterday. You do not have to do this kind of music for God to move in your church. You can do hymns. And I was teasing about some of those camp meeting songs that we sang as a kid. And I want to clarify that. I'm very proud of my heritage. Just over in the glory land got me this far. And there's not a thing wrong with it. If that's where your church is, don't curse it. But what God did this week is brought you here. And we got a chance to kind of jump into a couple of things that we've never done. Now, I want you to understand. So you don't go home and cause your pastor headaches. Because if you did that, that would not be conducive or in agreement with the spirit of what we've done this week. You understand? Okay, that's my housekeeping. Now, let's get some questions answered. And we did have wonderful, wonderful questions. Miss Lisa, are you going to be question asker? I don't have the, I have the old list. Give me the, what we did is we took, we assumed that uh, some of these questions, there were so many questions that we assumed that some of them would have been answered in the, we hoped, in the sessions and uh, we tried with limited time we've got this morning. Now, we want to open up questions for the singers. My wife is here, isn't she pretty? Hi. I shouldn't embarrass her that way. I'm sorry, baby. And, and the, the musician guys are over here. And Bill is here, all suited up and ready. Bill, what's, what's the suit? I... He ran out of casual clothes? Oh, okay. <laughs> you look like a preacher today, glory to God. Father, we, we, we start this session this morning, and we just ask for your wisdom. Lord, we don't claim to have the answers, but we so much love what you're doing in us, Lord. And we're just passionate for more. And we just ask that every question that we can answer with godly wisdom would be done that way. And we just ask you to open the minds of all the people here. And Lord, just help us to, to answer these and honor you and not bring any confusion to your kingdom, but bring reconciliation and unity. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Uh, one more thing to preface. The thing that we're asking for a question here at Brownsville right now is, what is it that God wants? And when we look at the Old Testament and we cross-reference into not the year 2000 in the mainstream church, we have to ask questions and go, why do we do that? And why did we stop? The thing a lot of, there's a lot of New Testament churches that have excluded music completely because they feel like there is no mention of music in the New Testament. My personal reason and belief that there's no mention of the New Testament music is because it's assumed that you knew it was there already. Because all of the early church believers, most of them in the leadership were Jewish. And they worshiped according to the synagogue. And so it would be my belief because we are now where we are and God's doing a fresh thing in us you're going to go home and continue somewhat of a style of worship that you've known, but hopefully with a new infusion of the Holy Spirit, right? Whether you're Presbyterian or whatever you are. It's an assumption that I make when I read the Scripture that when the day of Pentecost happened and the Holy Spirit fell, that they continued to worship in the synagogue. Also, they worshiped house to house. And I have a feeling the house meetings were probably a little wilder than the synagogue meetings. Okay? And there was definitely music in the synagogue because music is all through the Old Testament. Why would God discontinue the use of instrumentation in His worship just because the New Testament is here? Again, 
The New Testament does not cause, this is basic theology, does not say throw the Old Testament out. It's all over. It only types and shadows. The Old Testament types and shadows what the New fulfills. Do you understand? And there's a lot of people go, oh, God fulfilled the need for music, so we don't need it anymore. So there are certain things that we just make an assumption of. And, and, and I would think that would be easy. I hate when we split hairs over minor things, you know. Okay. Concerning worship. Do you have certain qualifications for worship team members? What about maturity in the Lord or non-believers? When are they required to be on the platform? Whenever I can get them there. Uh, I'm assuming this second part of this question is, what about maturity in the Lord and or non-believers? In other words, would I put a non-believer in the worship team? No. Or in the band? Uh, this is a controversial issue. And has everybody got mics? I would rather not us fumble around for mics. Just get one in your hand so if you got something... I want this, guys, I really want this to be a little more discussion than I do. And let me tell you, okay, uh, is that Mike live? Number yellow? Okay. Well, grab that cordless anyway and get ready there, Bill. Now, understand that all these people on the stage will possibly have different views. Now, what I love about discussion is it allows people to say things that you go, eh, I don't know. I like to hear both sides. And then I walk away and make a decision. That's how I feel. So a controversial, I don't want to dig too many worms up here and, and cause too much confusion. Uh, we can really go crazy with this. Uh, I had a situation where I had a, a non-believing musician play an offertory one time. I had a reason. Another thing is I don't recommend that believers go sit in nightclubs and, and drink because most of you come out of that kind of lifestyle and you don't need to be back in there. However, I was called by a mother one time who had raised her son in the ways of the Lord and she said, Lyndall, I heard that you've got a real burden for musicians. I said, I do. She said, well, I've got a son, he's 19 years old, and he's playing at, I forgot, something club about 30 miles from my house. And he was playing with Leonard Skinner. He said, that boy knows God. He said, that boy was raised in the ways of the Lord, and he don't belong there. He's been hurt in church. Can you help him? Well, I want to tell you, I grew up in church. I've never, I've never been drunk in my life. You know, and I've never smoked a cigarette, never wanted one. I think, man, if I want cancer, I'll just do something else, you know. So I got in my car on a Friday night. I drove 30 miles, and I walked into a nightclub. It was probably the first or second time I'd ever been to a nightclub. I ordered a glass of water, <laughs> and I sat at the table because, again, I don't want to be... You know, I don't want to cause stumbling blocks here, and somebody's liable to know one of my old choir members may be in there. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, <laughs> and if I see one of my current choir members, we really got a problem. <laughs> They're gonna look at me. What are you doing here? I'm going, what are you doing here? <laughs> so I sat down at the table, and I and I was enjoying my water, and I listened to the band do their set, and I like to suffocate it. Why people go to nightclubs, I'll never figure that out. It's just. It stinks. And so I sat and listened to them do their, their thing, and I pointed out this kid because I could see the Lord on him. I knew that he had the mark of God on him. And I enjoyed my... I went, when the musicians took their break, I went back to the back where they were. And I said, I congratulate them. said, play good. No, 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 no. And so, you know, there were, most of them were all unbelievers, and they were just cursing. And I mean, just it was just all that stuff. And I walk up to this kid, and I said... I understand your name is Tony. He said, yeah, my name is Tony. He said, uh, I said, I understand that you've been, it wasn't Tony, I'm sorry, somebody else. I said, uh, why, don't you, why don't you come play for me at church sometime? And I knew where he'd been playing. 
And uh, the Sunday morning he came to play, he drug his guitar amp in the church and it smelled like cigarette smoke and I knew where he'd been with it. But I said, I want you to play Amazing Grace for the altar, for the, for the, uh, I want you to play Amazing Grace for the offering. Now, I would never do that. But I felt there was time to go back and take back somebody that belonged with us. Because he knew the touch of God and I had full confidence that if I could get him in the glory, it's all it'd take. I was right. I was right. He started playing Amazing Grace that Sunday morning and tears started rolling down his face. And uh, he recommitted his life to the Lord and he led worship at my church when I left there and replaced me and he's still leading worship. Now, <clears throat> now I have not done it since. I have not done that since. I have not gone down to Seville club down here and set in to see if I could find musicians. You know, I haven't done that, and I, and I don't necessarily recommend that. But under, under normal circumstances, no. Under normal circumstances, I would not, by any means or circumstance, invite an unbeliever to play in worship. Because here's my belief on that. Number one, I believe they could praise the Lord with me. Because the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. But when we got into worship, that's where their unbelief would show. Now, I know this is a controversial issue. And I know there are different ways, but I'm just telling you what I do. It's not, you know what I'm saying? I have used unbelievers on recordings. Uh, I have one particular singer I used. And I knew that she, again, was struggling with, with what she was doing with the Lord. And again, it was my hope to bring her into the glory. Now, I've had people disagree with me on that. And you're free to disagree with me on that. But I am out there trying to, my attitude is to try to redeem those that have had a touch of the Lord on their lives. To, to, to bring them into a place. My belief is if this week we had had a house full of unbelievers or, or if we had filled the balcony full of people who had never known the Lord, that what they felt in the meetings would have drawn them to God. I believe that because I believe that music has that power when it's anointed to go into the soul and, and for a person to go, you know, I want this, but I don't understand it. And, and others it would have scared. But a lot of just unbelieving, now, it would have scared maybe people who had a religious background. But your basic old heathen out there who's never confessed the Lord would go into a meeting like this and go, this is cool. I like this music. I don't know what this is, but I like it. And something would have come down on the inside. And you have to understand, that's been my mission since I was 18 years old. God gave me a vision that there would come a time on the face of the earth that God would so anoint his music and he would so anoint the minstrels that played his music that it would have such a heavy conviction of God on it that it would elicit one of two responses. Either get me away from that as far as I can get because I can't stand what it's doing to me or it would totally draw them in to where they had to have more and they had to know more. And see again, it's a tool. All right? Uh, anybody got something to say there? Nope. Okay. Uh, when are my singers required qualifications for worship lead, uh, team members? I, these are questions for me. I'm sorry. Um, Y'all make a nice backdrop. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, we'll get to some that y'all can get into thick. Uh, they have to be uh, members of our church or either going through membership class. And here we have a very strict kind of membership requirement because people have to go through cleansing stream. Uh, Lila knows a bit more about that completely than I do. How long is that initial cleansing stream program? It's, 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 the course is 12 weeks, but we train in instruction and then there's a weekend uh, retreat. Okay, so there's 12 weeks of classes and then a weekend retreat that every choir member and worship team and musician 
and intercessors too, same requirement. Also, they have to be tithers. And yes, Brownsville, we do check tithing records. We really do. It's not that, because here's how strong we believe about tithing, not because we need the money, but a person who refuses to tithe when they've been taught to tithe is showing a deeper spiritual problem. They're showing a disconnect from the church when they refuse to tithe. And scripturally, it's very strict what God says about tithing. It calls you a thief. And the Lord says, anyone that's a thief's not entering the kingdom. And I don't want them on my platform. If they'll steal from God, they'll steal an instrument. I just, I just don't. <laughs> or my worship book. I mean, they'll steal my worship book. <laughs> Some non-tither got my worship book this week. But that's how strong we believe it. It's not so we can harness everybody, but it's just we believe that. Uh, they need to be walking in. And there are times with my choir members, and I haven't necessarily, I think I have done it a time or two on worship team. I have gone to them privately and asked them to step out for a few months uh, because I, I sensed that they needed to get closer to the Lord. See, this is a leadership role, a leadership position, and sometimes people need to pull away and refurbish themselves and get, get off the front line a while and get healed up and get full and then come back out. And sometimes we've all felt that, that we just needed. Of course, we've been in war for the last five years, so it hadn't been an option. Okay, keep it moving. What about rehearsals? How often do you practice? Next question. How do you motivate them to come? Uh, next question. Do the singers know? Uh, how often do we rehearse? Uh, Lisa is my assistant, and, and Mike is my assistant. And, and these guys, Lisa basically handles choir. They rehearse every other week uh, for about two or three hours, and we call special rehearsals for special events. Uh, the band, we're not, we hadn't got that down yet because I'm serious. I, how long have you had that chart for Grateful ready? Don't go there. Don't go there. No, no, really, about three months? About five months. She's had a new song. The choir's known. The band don't know it. It's my fault. It's got a lot of flat 13ths in it, and I've got to rehearse it, and I, I just haven't had time to woodshed it, you know? So, so what we do a lot of times is we'll come in on Sunday morning early and run through things and, with the band because, again, I have really, I have an unusual situation with musicians, too. If I were in the classic situation where a lot of you may be, uh, we'd probably rehearse once a week for two hours if I didn't, wasn't having all these extra services. So you have to, we have to have a little grace here because uh, there's a Tuesday night prayer meeting in here. Of course, I don't have to be there for that. There's a Wednesday night service that Mike leads worship for, and he has to have a band. And there's a Thursday night that I lead worship for that I have to have a band, and Friday night I lead worship, and I have to have a band and singers. And Saturday night, I usually lead worship, but the last three or four weeks, Mike's been doing that for me because I'm just pooped. And then Sunday morning, I'm doing that. I'm doing worship. And so... What do I want to do? Have everybody come back Monday night so they could be here every night of the week? You know, it's just, it's a, it's a situation that has just not been conducive for us to really tighten up our band. And, uh, and like I said, I think we've done all right without it. Um, Lando, can I just address that just really quickly? Two things. Uh, first of all, when we do um, get a new song, we, I try always to have it recorded. To get, yes. Even if we don't exactly do the same arrangement. That way, if they've got a chart and a recording of it, they can go and at least get a good idea before they come into the rehearsal. The other thing is, you can over-rehearse and it makes your musicians dependent upon rehearsal. You cannot flow freely in worship if you have musicians that are so dependent on rehearsal that they can't do anything unless it's rehearsed. And the best way to learn to swim is to jump in and just start beating around. So it's valuable not to over-rehearse. I learned this from my husband. I'm an over-rehearser. And um, he helped balance me out and just to go, look, there's times when rehearsal is not valuable. It just gets you too intent on there's a perfect way to do it. And if you don't do it the perfect way, it's not going to happen. Um, that inhibits a flow in worship. So sometimes And also, I'm spontaneous. I am extremely spontaneous. And I scared this church to death when I came here. 
because I think the other guys, they had rehearsed. And I was the king of, I pull things out when God gives them to me sometimes. And I'm not even sure I know the words. I'll think of a song that's, that I haven't sang since I was a kid. And I'll start off in it, and I'll know the first line. And I figure if I don't know the first line, if I know the first line, I look around and everybody else is not singing it. They don't know it either, so I can always make it up. which I've done many, many times. And then the ones who know it go, and I knew that first line, but I don't remember that second line being quite like that. And again, that's, that's what God is doing with us to, to be free. Just, just you gotta get past that, free of, that fear of being a fool. Because my wife, you know, she's learning to sing and she's got a wonderful voice and a lot of things in her. And one of the things I keep saying to Amber, I said, baby, you got to mess up in front of everybody and totally embarrass yourself a couple of good times and then you'll be okay because you'll just go, you know, I, I blew it, okay, I'm stupid. It's all right. It's okay to fall flat of your face. Laugh at yourself. How many times have I started the song in the wrong key? And I'll get all the way through the intro and start singing, and I'll go, oh, wait, well, stop. But most people, their pride and their performance thing goes, oh, I can't do that. But this is church. This is not a concert. If people were paying to get in here and it was a concert, then we'd rehearse it and we'd have a concert ready. But we also wouldn't be doing revival services every night. And so how do you think you keep fresh music? We couldn't rehearse all of that. We, we just, I hear a record and go, hey, Lisa, get that record. You know, and the singers, funniest thing is the first couple of records we recorded, we weren't, we, I didn't want to record. I was kind of hateful about it. Because I, I just hate manufactured stuff. And so I, I'd been producing records in Nashville. That's what I did, and I loved it. But God was doing a new thing with me. And so we, 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 we got to do this record, and we recorded it all live. And, and we pulled a drummer out of Mothballs, Scott. It was nothing like it is now. I mean, this guy was a pastor, youth pastor across town. He hadn't played drums in years. And, and, and I, played a, I played a click track loop on my, on my Lynn, just on my Kai, because I wanted to make sure at least something was on one. You know what I mean? And, and, and he, he did pretty good at hanging with it. And that's how we recorded that record. And uh, we got to mix and got to listen to the background singers. And they were singing different words than I was singing. <laughs> and we had been going for two months of revival, three months of revival, singing different words. But... It didn't seem to stop God. I don't know. It just, we still do that occasionally. When I pull out something new, they think they heard what they didn't hear. You know what I mean? That sounds like my phone. Rita, turn your phone off. Okay. Uh, how do I motivate them to come? Lindell? Yeah. I had just one thing to add to that. Yes. Um, in, in the rehearsal time, during the school year, the BRSM, uh, the Brownsville School of Ministry, have their services on Thursday night. We work with a student team, and we do rehearse every week for two hours. And one thing that, that I just, just want to interject is that we, a lot of times, focus on the physical preparation, getting all the notes right. But please, I just want to encourage you to remember also our spiritual preparation and a lot of times we'll have a two-hour rehearsal and the only time we're together as a group is when we're hashing out notes and hashing out arrangements and I would just encourage your worship leaders to to release your worship teams in your sanctuary if, in, if it's once a month get together on a Saturday morning and uh, get oil out and anoint the, the benches and the seats and the pews and pray for the glory of God cry out for the glory of God to come in your sanctuary because on all honesty, uh, we are really moving from a point of music driving people to the sheer presence of God showing up and changing hearts. And I know that's your desire to have that happen. So I just want to kind of, when you talk about the whole rehearsal thing, I think we're moving from a, we're, you know, to a two-pronged approach. One is the actual technical uh, approach, but then also there's, there's that mending and molding of the spiritual uh, heart and hunger for, for the glory of God. Also, Bill, we found that to be true. We, we started at the beginning of this year doing Monday night meetings uh, with just the musicians and the worship singers to come in and worship together. And Lisa was there, some of those. It was awkward because it's like we knew how to do our little thing on stage. We'd done that for years in revival. But it was so awkward when nobody was there and we weren't there to rehearse. 
We were just there to worship. And it saddened me because I realized that I knew how to worship alone and I knew how to worship with an audience. But when we were just there for the Lord, I didn't know how to do that. And I thought, wait, we should know how to do this better than we do in front of the audience. What we do in front of the audience should be extension of what we're doing alone. And so it's, like I said, Bill, it's been a learning. Let's take an inter... Scott. I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> let's take a... Let's take an... Inter <laughs> it's coming back. Spent so much trying, trying to get the microphone and waiting for you to finish. I just can't... <laughs> Get a pen and write it down. <laughs> Musicians have short memory span. Let's take an intercession question. Lila, do you have certain qualifications for your intercessory prayer me 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 members? Yes, well, there were quite a few of in our uh, people that were here yesterday that were in my session. We addressed that. We would say a ditto to everything that Lyndall uh, requires for his worship. And, and choir members, but uh, we have even extended it more. We do personal interviews, and uh, I don't do them myself, so you'll like me if you're rejected. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have three people that do the interviews, two of them that, that actually are, are, are asking the questions, and a third one that sits there, because you can look great on paper, and uh, if you're from another church, which we welcome intercessors from other churches, and uh, you, ha you would require a pastoral letter you know, that, that uh, indicates that you're not only in, in good relationship with the church, but uh, all of the requirements that we would have for the Brownsville people. But sometimes when you're face on, one on one, things will begin to emerge. You know, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if, you, uh, if you're not considered um, ready to be a part, you may be given, uh, you know, apply again in six months or something like that. <clears throat> we try to give a letter uh, out and hopefully your feelings aren't going to be hurt because what we're looking for is not people who are necessarily prophetic and, uh, and, and gifted in that area because oftentimes they're free flyers and uh, they have, are very independent. No, that's the truth. They're very independent and they've flown from church to church to church. And so all of our intercessors are required to be church members under, uh, under uh, a headship of a pastor. I believe that uh, intercession is, is merely helps ministry. And, and so therefore you need a pastoral covering, strong pastoral covering. And <clears throat> when, you, when you join, we have uh, a probationary period. And you say, oh, this is very stringent, this is very hard. But as I said yesterday, I believe that the prayer department, those that, that bear the burden of the Lord in prayer, that needs to be the cleanest place in the church. That needs to be the most free. We require going through um, cleansing streams because we don't want things, because, because the nature of the, of the intercession does become quite prophetic because we're always asking, what, like Lyndall said, what's on God's heart. And so in order to find that out, it's gonna take a prophetic form of some sort because we're going to, it's not, I don't, I don't consider the prophetic always, thus saith the Lord. It, uh, it's something that we didn't know that God has given us information on. And so that now is new information for us to move in. I believe that the prophetic can be developed in every person because Paul says that we're to covet to prophesy. Uh, Moses said, I would that God, all of God's people prophesy. Now we're not talking about an office of a prophet, we're talking about the ministry of, of the prophetic. What I'm looking for are people who have, who have a broken and a contrite heart, that they, have a, that they are, have a spirit of submission, they know how to submit, that they're not going to get their feelings hurt easily, that's why we ask them to go through cleansing streams so that they're not the walking wounded. We don't want when, uh, when somebody's in inter intercession or, you know, so deeply moved in, 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 in tears and stuff like that, that it to be, be a bad hair day, you know, or uh, you had a fight with your husband for you, before you came. Amen. We want to know that that's not coming out of the soul realm, that that's coming out of the spirit. You know, everybody's over there, oh, yeah, let's pray with this person till they, till they you know, pray through on it. And here it is, you know, they just got to... A day of the weepies, you know, and so we feel that that this is very important to separate the soul from the spirit, and this is what cleansing streams is all about to help help us get healed. Amen. Help us get healed. So um, one of the other things we do pe put people on probation, 
sometimes and, and not necessarily as a uh, because they've done something wrong but because as Lyndall says I can see something going on or I sense it each of our people the new people that come in are assigned to a mentor of our leadership so that they have that person that they can go to and if they're having marital problems family problem anything that's a distraction because when they come into the intercessory prayer room, they're, they're to be totally focused. That is the main goal, to be totally focused and, and minister to the Lord and find out what's on your heart, oh God. And so if you're going through something that will keep, your, keep you distracted, then we just ask, please don't even come in. Come in. It, it, we're not mad at you. We're not upset with you. But uh, let's be on hiatus until that's taken care of. Was that? That's the answer. I also want to say, Lala, your, your intercessors... Have work under that too. I've, I've noticed like this week um, there's been a deference I've, that I'm just blessed by because uh, well Val was in the other night, just last night she was over there inter interceding and praying for Bill while he was leading worship and she says now if I'm in your way just push me out of the way. You know it's like they're not they don't run around with their you know feelings on their elbows it's like you and, and, and and I want to say thanks also to all of you because everyone has just shown deference this week. Bill and, and it's just Lisa and all of you. It's just awesome. Another, can I get another one for you? You may not want to answer this one. Is it normal after intercession that you should have pain or fatigue? Is this a part of intercession? Were you tired last night? Yes. And tired the <laughs> night before, okay. And we were doing, we were doing uh, uh, a dancing, and we were, we were moving into an area of warfare and worship and so on. If you really got into it, you were tired when you finished. And uh, so many of us, when we pray, you know, if you really get into the intensity, the pain, um, you know, everybody has their own, their own uh, idea about uh, intercession. Uh, I have a 28 tape series that we cover most of this stuff from soup to nuts. And uh, we have one on burden and, and intercession and travail, and these are some of the questions. And they can't be easily, dis you know, easily explained in one or two or three minutes. And so, if you um, if you'll avail yourself of it, otherwise, um, I think I just told my my um, uh, uh, Bonnie, who, who takes care of our distribution, that she could take orders for particular tapes instead of having to buy the whole series for particular tapes. If you were interested in just one subject, she will not have them available today, but they could be sent to you. So if there's one or two particular things that you want to ask, uh, you know, information on, then you'll be able to avail yourself. I've also written a book, and a lot of this material that we have here, uh, or the questions that we have here, is certainly covered in our, in fact, I would say most of it is covered in our different sessions. Could, We're not trying to sell anything. Well, We're well just, I know that, but is it okay for us to still ask those questions? For, of course, of course. All right, can we go uh, to that next the one? The pain. Okay, the, explain uh, the significance and symbolism of the banner colors. Yes. Okay. I know there are those that are, are really sold on banners, you know, that everything uh, everything has a color and its significance and all that. Um, you know, if that's your persuasion, that's up to you. You know, I don't, uh, I don't major on minors. And uh, there's also a question here, why do people wave the banners over people? I don't know. Maybe they're trying to get the flies off of them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I have not got a clue. And uh, so because people, you know, why does somebody tap their foot when they're playing the guitar and other people don't? You know what I'm saying? Everybody, they, we all have our own idiosyncrasy. Let's loosen up and lighten up, you know? And, and everything doesn't have to have a, you know, a jot and a tittle. Uh, I, I want to share this one scripture as I was reflecting on some of this stuff. And I think Linda will like this too because we're getting ready to preach. No. <laughs> um, Joseph Garlington, when he came here, he, he said something so profound because, you know, I came from, from traditional, you know, mainstream uh, Christianity, and a lot of this stuff was very new to me, and we've had to just, you know, dive in. I'm basically a teacher who likes all of the, the T's crossed and the I's dotted, and I really like everything, you know, neat, and, and that's not going to happen in revival. Everything is messy. And, uh, and I was pressed and pushed to do things that I could not scripturally base, you know, at the, and I, I'm not saying that we should do things without having a scriptural basis, but I want to say this, that, that the scriptural basis will sometimes catch up with you. And this was a wonderful scripture that, that Joseph Garlington had shared, and that's in Acts, the first chapter. It says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and then to teach. 
And so when, we, when we're dealing with certain things like prophetic um, uh, manifestations and, and prophetic gestures and so on, I have books on, that I could refer you to as well as I've taught on those particular subjects myself. Uh, there are some books here. In fact, I'll, I'll just... I just got one here. I, I brought it back from Israel called uh, Prophetic Gestures. I'll set them down here. I don't have them for sale, but uh, you might be able to jot down uh, the address. Uh, one of them's on the lecture and the other's on the answer. So it's a workbook and a teaching book. Another one is Interpreting the Symbols and Types by uh, Kevin Connor, and that will, will introduce you to colors. They come to the conclusion of colors by, uh, and I teach, I teach this, tabernacle, the different colors in the tabernacle, white. Just you can t you can study it out yourself. Get yourself a Strong's Concordance. Look up the word white and follow it all the way through. And ask, what is God saying? He's saying your garments are going to be white. The purity it always has to do. White always has to do with purity. What color is red? What does that represent most of the time? Blood. I mean, see, some of these are just really simple. Now, when they're waving the people, or, uh, waving the flags over the people, are they waving them? I don't know. You know. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't believe that there's like, anything. Lila, isn't it kind of just like, a spontaneous thing? Well, it's kind of like the thing. It is. I, I grab a banner every once in a while. Sure. I don't have a clue why I grab it. I just. Yeah. It just looks fun. Yeah. Um, We're celebrating. Yeah. That, uh, instead of instead of saying it's some heavy, deep spiritual, you know, intercession thing. Well, We're the, just celebrating. Well, the other thing is why there are so many things that are in the scripture, that that really make no sense. Like, <laughs> why, why do you need to lay hands on people? The scripture says, if there's any sick among you, let them call the elders to let them anoint his head with oil. Right. Why do they anoint with oil? I don't understand what significance that I know the, si the symbolism and the type sure. and the Holy Spirit sure. and all sure. that. Of course we do. But, but you know, I, I, I guess I kind of put waving banners, dancing, uh, jerking and, and, and physical manifestation, and all that kind of in the same package of going, I don't really get it. And, and, and in some cases, a lot, what you might find un, un, unusual to understand is I don't like a lot of it. Uh, I'm really more conservative than you think I am. My spirit pushes my body to be less conservative. Yes. Because I want to be free to worship the Lord. And the few scriptural references I find of my favorite, one of my favorite worshipers, David, was that he was totally uninhibited. Right. He was a, just a nut to worship God. And most of our psalms came from the fact that we had professional musicians sitting behind instruments, playing in the tabernacle 24 hours a day, and David would come in from a long day of battle or whatever he was doing, and he would get in the presence of the Lord and he would start to sing. And he would, and the scribe, the temple scribe, would take those down, and we have psalms. That's what that is. And so I say, if David was free to do that, why can't I be free to do that? And why is it that the church has become afraid to express fresh music to the Lord? And you know, and and what's you know the problem I have with us is we get stuck on like just a, a one chord, and it's because we're so unused to flowing in this that we're just starting at elementary and I believe there's yet new things to be written that would be honoring to God that will come straight out of the worship but I believe that the anointing of oil or the lifting of hands I mean why are we doing that the same people who will criticize a banner will do this right. Right. well one looks about as silly as the other if you ask me <laughs> well that Go. in a sense is lifting a banner it is. Yeah. It's lifting a banner. Yeah, it's symbolic so, of lifting a banner. But I, I say you don't make these things bigger than they are. Right. You know what I mean? Well, you go anywhere where there's a group gathered, football game. People are painting their bodies. Get a life. People are raising up those fingers. Why do people have those fingers <laughs> lifted up? And they blow those, those horns of the football game. And nobody goes, now, do you have a reason why you do that? <laughs> You got five guys in a commercial with their bodies painted with letters going, ha! And everybody goes, yeah! Because it's an outward expression of an inward experience. It gives people who aren't playing the game the ability to participate in what's going on. Don't try to dissect it. Get into it. 
Well, I think she said it. Carol Hazel. Uh, Monday night, when we started worship, Lyndall came and gave us a banner. He was giving some of us banners, and it's kind of hard to sing and dance and do banners and all that, and I start losing. Anyway, he, he was handing me a banner, and he handed me the green one, and he took it back, he's, and he handed me the gold one. He says, no, you need the glory tonight. And I went, hmm, cool. You know, we don't do that. We've never really, we just go grab banners and wave them, and it's fun, and it's wonderful, and it lifts your faith. And I think when he said that to me, at the moment it made an impact on me, but later in the service, when Jessica, my precious niece, came up and started singing to the Lord out of her heart, I was sitting behind her, and I felt something say, pick up that glory banner and wave it over her. And if what he did was just spoke faith to me in my heart, and that banner's just wood and cloth, but something was spoken in here, and I picked it up and started waving it over her, and then I started waving it over worship team members, and then I took it over there and prayed for Nolan and waved it over the audio department, and I'm waving it over the camera and praying for the whole television department. You know, those guys are back there working. You don't ever see them. I'm like, God, let that glory rest on those guys. And I, and I found Bill Bush over there. I found me some ushers. I, I, was, I was walking through. And then every now and then, though, I would feel stupid. And I thought, you know, you're out here, and they're singing spontaneous to the Lord. You need to sit down and be quiet. Oh, I found Lila laying over there on the steps, and she looked dead. And I went and waved that glory. Not a lot. And it wasn't just on Lila, it was on the whole intercessors. And I was seeing things in my spirit. And, and you know, maybe there's nothing in it, but something happened deep in here. And it was causing my face to rise up and release the glory. And Brenda, I was trying to get to you, but I know the glory was on you. But I wanted to go over there. And I thought, no, you're going to get in trouble if you go over there. But that's what happened to me. You see, that was a perfect example because the interpretation was in the person. That's why when you're asking me an abstract, abstract question about why people are doing certain things, I don't know. I mean, I might know why I'm doing something as the Holy Spirit moves. In. And this is the beauty of the body ministry. This is the yeah. beauty of everybody having freedom to be and do what they are and who, who they are. Carol, how many? You, Carol had something. Hold on, Bill, just a second. Carol had her, her mic up. <laughs> I believe is obedience. That's right. Come on. If God tells you to do it, right. you do it. You don't question why. You don't. There you go. You feel stupid. <laughs> stupid. When God told me to go and stand behind Benny when he played the other day, I don't know why God told me to do it, but I went and I did. And when I am obedient, he fulfills the purpose of what he is wanting to do, not me. I look stupid, but his purpose is fulfilled. It's, I, I really believe we're, we're coming into a time where we need to be open to that. How many of that, that big river banner thing? That, what's with that? Looks like a sheet. That's a big sheet. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, there's, I don't understand it. And you know, one thing that struck me, I got so grieved when I watch the Super Bowl. How many, how many of y'all watch the halftime show at the Super Bowl? Being a creative, I always, you know, lock it. You guys, please be honest. Do y'all not watch football? Y'all did not watch the Super Bowl? I didn't watch it. All right, you're different though, Lyndall. <laughs> but but what, what, the, what, what it ended up, they had, it was pageantry that had no budget. And what happened was they had these drums started and these people came out with these big flags and they literally raised this like 10 story figure. It was like, a, it was like idol worship. It was just bizarre. Yeah. I'm going, this is a halftime show. But, 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 but what the spirit of God was, was saying to me was that, that there's going to be a resurrection of the pageantry and the flags. Had, we're just seeing the beginning of that. But one thing I wanted to just to, just to I made a note of that when Jesse came up to sing about the fountain and, and the river, I, I looked up at one point and I, I had a, I just by chance, I had a blue banner. And I was sitting here waving this banner and totally just getting ministered to. And I looked across, Lyndall had a blue banner and he was waving. I looked back and I think uh, Hazel or somebody was over there with the blue banner. 
Now go figure. That was a, just a real powerful time in the service for me. I, it was just incredible. I don't, I don't know what the Spirit of God is doing. All I'm saying is please don't make a snap judgment. We've seen stuff in the past. We've all been to revivals in the past. But this is just a new day. It's a new time. It's a new time of revelation, so, so I should be open to that. And also, the pageantry we've known. When Bill first started talking to me about pageantry, I kind of shrunk back because all I could see was those tassels on those women and those little hoop things. And, 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 and I always tell you, I'd just rather be shot in the head than have to endure that. Now, if that's your ministry, it's wonderful. Praise God. But it's, but it's, it, what it does to me is, is it draws attention because it says, you sit and watch while I worship. And for my heart, that doesn't mean I think that's bad. And, and, and I want to have a dance team here. But what I want to, we don't have one. Pastor don't know that I want one yet. And when I get one, I may get fired. If he'll let me have one, we'll have one. But the one I want to have is not so they can then get their little hoops and their streamers. I'll, they may have those, but I don't want them to clear the stage up here so we can watch a pageant. Yeah. I want to station them all in the sanctuary so that when we start to worship, they all dance something they have rehearsed to dance to the Lord, but it's unto the Lord, not unto the people. Do you see what I mean? That way you're not going, ooh, look how good they dance, because we don't have trained dancers. Come on, let's admit, most of our dancing in most churches is awful, and most of our drama is like really bad Broadway. And our props and our costumes are equally bad. You know, and our, it, C.S. Lewis said it better than anything. He said, most Christian music is second-rate lyrics written to third-rate melodies. And it's really true. So if it doesn't have the anointing of God on it, and if it doesn't bring glory and honor to God and it's not as unto the Lord, then it's silly to do it. That's the reason we're not a big proponent. Of, we don't do a lot of, of, of cantatas. Not because I don't think cantatas are effective. They may do wonderful in your church. But we used to do them in this church. We had that living Christmas tree. We sold that rascal. Praise God. We gave him over to somebody that wants to mess with him. It had a purpose at a time in this church. They would go down to the mall and set it up in the middle of the mall and sing Christmas songs and, and minister the Word, and that's powerful, and that had a season here. But the season is over now, and I think what God is saying to us at Brownsville, this day may not apply to you, but to us He's saying, for me, it's like if we do a drama like Unity last night that has a purpose, we know that these actors are not great. You know what I mean? But it's, it's, it's to further draw you in to a central focus on the Lord or a central subject. And that's what I want to see dance in the church do. Because I don't want you to sit and watch somebody dance. I want all of you to dance. Now, you don't have to. And I don't want to put Connor. Let me say one thing to you about dance. One of the things that Bill and I cautioned Bill on one time, I remember. <laughs> Bill didn't mean it bad. But Bill got into this revelation of dancing. And just like a maniac. Because, again, he had never done that, I'm assuming. That wasn't your nature to do it. And so it was fresh and new to him. And him and Lisa both like, man, we need to dance. You know, and I'm going, well, okay, we'll dance then. What can happen if that ever moves away from the Spirit and it comes away from being motivated of the Lord and unto the Lord? I grew up around the black church, the, and a lot of uh, Church of God in Christ, and also some of the white Pentecostal churches I associated with when I was a kid. It was wild. I mean, we jerked to the floor and back up again, and all this jerking's nothing new to me. I remember it when I was a kid. Man, we ran around. We had pool of Bethesda services. Y'all ever done one of those where everybody walks through the pool and they get to jerk? You know. <laughs> I've seen it all, man. I've seen them climb tent poles. I, I mean, there's, you name it, I've seen it. I've seen them lay on the floor and flop like a fish out of water. I mean, I've seen it. Roll it, <laughs> come out under the big top, watch them fall and crawl like reptiles. I mean, I've, I've just, I grew up around tent revivals. Some of you, your mouth is wide open, but I've seen all that. Some of it was God, some of it was just flesh. But what that can lead to 
and I'm, I'm saying this, I want all my, my black brothers and sisters to not take me wrong with what I'm about to say. Hear my heart. What we've had in our black churches is a free expression of praise that we white folks need some of. But the problem is it creates an adrenaline need. It's like I will listen to Brother, you know, I will listen to Carlton Pearson do Azusa on the CD and just my spirit will go, yeah, come on, Carlton. If I was there, I mean, you'd have to peel me off the ceiling. But you watch the video and all the black brothers and sisters are just sitting there looking at it. They got to hit a certain button before they'll really get in because they've become immune to that praise. Do you see what I'm saying? That's the reason a, a white boy like me can do enemy's camp and all the honkies start dancing because they've never seen anything like that. I mean, they, they've never been free. They're from England, they're from Scotland, and they, and, you know, and they see a white boy up there just going crazy. And they go, hey, I can do that, go. And it's like, you know, and I look out and, and we'll have black brothers and sisters here and they're going, okay, when are they really going to get something happening? <laughs> well, man, we're happening as far as we're concerned, you know what I mean? <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? So the thing that I don't want to see created in praise is that we create a need to hit that button, to get that emotional response. And that's where we have to temper it with realizing it's as unto the Lord. We need, our, our, we need every cultural expression in the church. We white folks need to rub a little of that off on us. But also, consequently, the black church needs to learn the intimacy of worship that doesn't need the hammond and the drums and all that, that maybe God wants to move in in total silence and lay all the open the heart. You see, we need one another. We need one another to be complete. And that's why Satan hates unity so much. That's the only prayer Jesus prayed. Shut up, Linda, I'm preaching. That was not fulfilled. Okay, questions. Uh, Linda, could I add something? Feel my help as coming far on. As, uh, I'm as sorry. far as the dance and the visual, we are a visual generation more so than any other time in all of history. And so God is making sure that we get the that we get the picture. He's making sure that we understand what He's trying to say. He's using the audio, the 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 the, the voices, and He's using our eyes, and so and our, also our bodies because uh, these are all an expression. And we talk about uh, uh, moving our bodies and so on, but there's a language in the body. In fact, the world has even coined a phrase called body language. And uh, I tell you, I, I can read my husband's. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can, uh, when I come home, I can tell exactly what kind of a day he had because of his body language. And when you live with somebody long enough, you, you can read it. And sometimes I don't even have to, you know, live with them to be able to read, you know, people's body language. Well, now, if the world has picked up on that, and here we are in, in, in church, and we begin to do movements or actions or stuff like that, I believe that there's something that we're speaking that, uh, that there's a whole realm that we are encompassed around about. There's a whole other realm besides where we live. And, uh, and, th and, that, and, and we are expressing something. We, when we wave banners, again, I want to get back to that, um, I feel a lot of times it's the rhythm too. There's something in the rhythm, and when you're, when you're doing it with the musicians, it's like a, like a, a, a participating because you're not playing an instrument maybe you're not singing but it's participation and it draws it draws you in and so all of these things are are what I would call um, things that don't don't strain at a gnat and swallow a camel you know or don't throw out the baby with the bathwater because uh, because somebody maybe abuses or does something that you don't agree with or, or what you consider abusing we don't know the heart we don't know what I didn't know that that hazel was even doing it. thank thank you for waving the glory over me I was dead <laughs> I mean, this will, I'm a great grandmother, you know, I had, I had danced, I mean, I had, mm, I laid down over there, I said, God, give me the glory, or kill me, you know, and so, and so she, <laughs> so she, I, I was laying there, and I said, God, I want your glory, I didn't even know that she waved the flag, but I tell you, we got up and danced a few more miles after that.
Yeah, yeah, we did. And so I just praise the Lord for the spontaneity. That's, let's, let's loosen up and let people express God in their own personality. Not everybody's going to be the same way. You don't have to shake. You don't have to wave a banner. You don't have to even dance. if you don't. That might not be your style. But please don't, don't inhibit someone else from it. Now, let me say one more thing of this, that this is going to be a, the, counter, the counter side of that. I believe I like the liturgy. And that's always something that happens the same way every time. I think the most powerful church I will ever see on earth is when what we've done this week embraces the liturgy and the beauty of the Eucharist. Because there's a certain protocol to things in the heavenlies. And see, a lot of, a lot of people who are into free worship and who are assemblies of God, and all, they would never consider saying that. But I'm not afraid to. Because I believe the early church worshipped according to synagogue practice and pattern. And there is a pattern to things in the heaven. Uh, Dick Rubin had brought this phrase to us that when the pattern's right, the glory falls. And there's an honoring of Israel that we should be bringing back into the church. And a pageantry in that. There's also an honoring of the body and the blood of Christ that should be brought among us. And I'm, I'm afraid most of our Protestant churches do a really lousy job of honoring the body and the blood of Christ. We just do. We, we so much make it, we're so afraid of being Catholic that we've gone the other extreme. I'm not Catholic. I don't believe in worshiping Mary. I don't believe she's deity. I don't believe in immaculate conception. I don't, you know, I am not a Catholic person. But I believe there are brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church that love Jesus with all their heart and they're part of the body. But I also believe, again, just like I believe the black and the white and the yellow and the red cultures can borrow from one another and become whole, I believe the same applies to liturgy, free worship, and free expression. When, when all those get bundled up, it's powerful and it's awesome. Okay, let's ask a band question. Uh, Scott, what do you do? Steve, just just on that note, when um, a lot of people start getting afraid when we're talking about liturgy and, and form, thinking that's a ritual, which it can be, but um, like in the school of ministry, in our leadership class, they talk about um, the more authority that you're submitted to. Which, which is spiritual and, and in all senses that the more authority you have, like the centurion, he, he, he was a man of authority, and he all, which he had people under him, and, but he was also submitted to authority, which there were people over him. So we need to, we, we need to recognize the, the traditions of the church, the things that, that God has instituted in the church and, and be submitted to those, not, not just out of, um, dead tradition, but out of honor to God, and and He's gonna He's gonna honor that in us, and give us more authority. Good, Steve. Good, absolutely. Uh, what do you do when your drummer tends to be behind? Why don't you ask me that question, Lyndall? <laughs> no pun intended. I didn't write it. I'm just reading it. <laughs> And also there's a question off of that that says, uh, I think we answered that sufficiently in yesterday's class, but in, just in case they didn't quite get it, you know, do you follow the drummer or does the drummer follow everybody else? Okay. Well, I guess that's sort of a technical question. Uh, we've talked a little bit this week, even backstage about metronomes. How many here drummers or bass players? Oh, good, good bunch of you. Congratulations. Um, uh, okay, first question was drummers being behind. You know, the best, I think one of the best things that any musician can do, not just the drummers, especially the drummers, but anybody, is to set a click 
get a metronome out, any kind of metronome, preferably one of those little digital ones where you can watch the light flash, uh, flashing or, or hear it, and play with it for 15, 20 minutes a day until you can't hear it anymore. When you can't hear it, you know you're right with it. And uh, there is such a thing as flux with, uh, with the metronome. Sometimes you get a little on top of it, sometimes you get a little bit of behind it, but your goal always needs to be to stay with it. And as you get used to that, you'll be able to start to, to turn off the metronome and be able to, uh, to keep a real solid uh, pulse without straying too far from, uh, from where it needs to go. If you're struggling at all with tempo getting on top or behind, to me, that's the, that's the best remedy for it. And I encourage all musicians to work with a metronome because of the, the second question, which was, do you follow the, uh, the drummer? Should the drummer follow somebody else? Uh, I said this yesterday. I am submitted to Lindell as the worship leader here, uh, or whoever happens to be sitting in the driver's seat at any given moment. But as a drummer, my role is to is to make the, is to to put my best foot forward in making sure that there is a pulse that we adhere to. When things start to when people start to get excited, the tendency is to start running away with the tempo, to get ahead of it. Uh, and everybody's guilty of that, including drummers, including myself. As soon as I start to feel everybody starting to run away with it, I will start to dig in a little bit harder with my kick drum, with my hi-hat, just to try and say, hey, hello everyone, we've got a tempo to adhere to. However, if that starts to take precedence over what's happening in worship, if I'm just exercising my pride and saying, doggone it, I'm the drummer and you're going to stay here, <laughs> We got a problem. We got a problem. There are things more important than the technical issues of playing music. Those are, there are foundations that have to be adhered to. But sometimes when people are getting excited, best thing to do is just to take your hands off and say, all right, Lord, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And I'm going to follow you. It's not even so much about following the worship leader as just trying to sense where God is taking the worship leader and me being submitted to him or her, you know, what's happening in that context. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, let me ask a question to Glenn, who's not spoken up yet. And Glenn, this is not to put you on the spot. And it's not necessarily a technical question. Uh, it's, this is not on our list. This is a Lendo question. Uh, when Glenn came to this church, and uh, I think Brenda Kilpatrick can attest to this. Uh, when I first met some of our staff in Toronto, Canada, and we had gone to a meeting there, and Van Lane was trying to fill me in. And he's such a sweet man, but he's kind of letting me know the do's and don'ts at Brownsville. And I was appreciating the input, but I knew if I knew the do's and don'ts, if I happened to want to do one of the don'ts, then I would be in rebellion. And I don't like rebellion. I won't work in rebellion. I figure that a lot of the reason people shriek back from a style or a type of instrument or a music or a sound is because it's been presented to them wrongly. You know, because somebody said, uh, one of the first things he says is, look, they don't like rap music at Brownsville. And I said, stop. Don't tell me anymore. Well, I went on to find out that they didn't like guitars that did solos either. And nobody told me that. I just learned it. So I walked very cautiously like on eggs with that whole issue. But I knew if we ever got the right situation, that they would see the value. To me, now this is Lindell's interpretation, when, when Glenn or one of the guitar players that are skilled in worship and they have a worshiping heart, when they pick up that instrument, they start playing a solo that pierces through the whole mix of the music. It's like a sword to me that just comes in there and just goes whack, whack, whack. And I love it, but I had never used it here. I found Glenn by accident because Vineyard came here because we sang so many Vineyards and records and they did a Vineyard Winds of Worship here. And, and I'd never met Glenn before and Glenn walked on stage with his guitar and I thought, well, this will be interesting. So Andy Park, who is a Vineyard writer and worship leader, he and I shared the record. And so 
he led half of it, I led half of it, and we used the same common band. Well, I, we, we were all doing mostly Andy Park songs. We called him Elvis Park that week. Uh, but we did I See the Lord, and you did a solo that day. And that Brenda Kilpatrick was here, and you'll remember that that was probably the first guitar solo of that type we had ever done in this church. And when, and there was, we were in such deep worship singing, I see the Lord in his train fields his temple, that I thought, wow, well, this is great, but we'll probably lose them right here. And when Glenn started to play that solo, because that solo comes right after the bridge. We just sang, and it's at the highest part of the song. And the temple is filled with the glory of God, and the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. And then here comes Glenn with this solo. And this, the response was everybody standing and cheering. You could hear it on the CD, which took me back. The question I have for you, Glenn, is you've worked with me a lot in worship, and you do a lot of worship with Promise Keepers and Vineyard and things like that. What, I don't want to get too hypothetical, but what is your, what's your motivation of heart when you're worshiping, when you're playing guitar in a worship band? What is, what's, why do you like doing it? Because obviously you have opportunity to do other things. What is it that brings you back to want to do this? Well, in a moment, I'm thinking, God, you got to help me or else they're going to burn me at the stake. <laughs> because when I, when I came to the church, I just thought we were doing a record and I didn't know about the revival. And uh, as we walked on the property, it was like midnight. It was, at, you know, we all came into the airport late and, and uh, there were bodies laying all over the foyer and bodies, you know, just people everywhere. And I was just amazed. And as I about to step foot on the carpet, this guy in a red coat grabbed my arm. and Elmer. Yeah, put, put me in a headlock. And he said, no hats in the sanctuary. And I thought, I thought, there's people swinging from the, from the speakers. And, you know, and it's just like, and I'm not allowed in the building without a hat. So, you know. Just, just wait till I do a guitar solo in this place. That I'll never come back. I may never go home. So, um, you know, I, I uh, halfway through the through the rehearsal process, I asked the guys at the Vineyard to change my name on the record because I didn't want to be responsible for the aftermath. <clears throat> so that particular record doesn't have my real name on it. Um, I, you know, church. Church and guitar is just a, a strange thing. I, I honestly don't know what the answer is. I, I think uh, the, the more I get to know God, the more I realize that uh, my righteousness is filthy. And, you know, if, if there's anything that good's, good that comes from it, it's, it's Him. So when I, when I show up in church, I just, you know, ask Him to give me mercy and favor and, and know that whatever I play, he can work with it and that it really doesn't have much to do with me and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and you know that's sort of how I get through it. Do you mind if I add something to that? Um, Paul uh, said that he, I, uh, I didn't come to you with wise and persuasive words but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith would not rest on me but on the Spirit of God. And um, there is something very important about preparing. I could apply that to, to what we all do. We can rehearse, we can be the very best that we can be at our instrument, but, but that, it, it sort of, that only gets you so far. There comes a point where you have to get beyond whatever you're capable of doing, because that can become a pride issue. What I want to do when I sit down behind those drums is I want to go to war. I want to go into battle. I said that yesterday. I want there to be a demonstration of the Spirit's power. If I sit down behind the drums, if Glenn picks up his guitar in any way with a prideful attitude or with an angry attitude about some technical problem or some weak link in the band, it's going to trip up somebody's worship experience.
Even people who aren't musically inclined know when something's wrong. They can sense when, when there's some element in the building that is inhibiting the Spirit of God from descending upon people. I, wanna, I want there to be a demonstration of God's power when I sit down behind the drums. So I've got to set aside all the technical issues. It, those help me. They help me sometimes, but there's, there's way more than that. And if that isn't the driving passion of our heart, when we get up in front of people to lead them in worship, then chances are somebody's worship experience is going to be cheapened. And God help me if I'm responsible for that. God help me. Benny, you have a, a thing that you share real quick. I'd like for you to do it. And we're going to finish these questions up here. But you had something concerning meekness. That, that, that you share that we really love around here. Could you just share that with everybody? Yeah. Um, you know, this church here has, um, has about a 50, at least a 50 year history to it. And a lot of the churches that you're in have, you know, there's some new churches that spring up, but a lot of churches have been around for at least for a few decades. And churches um, go through, you know, they evolve. The church of God is a living, moving, breathing organism. It's an organism. That's the, it's the, the body. We're supposed to be the body of Christ. And pastors come in, <clears throat> pastors come in and inherit congregations they go for a season and they retire or they pass on or they move and congregations change with time and they have children and their grandchildren and the community changes the, the economy changes and the uh, you know the music changes the culture changes and every every church has a cultural climate to it, I believe. And even even churches in America that are called uh, multicultural, you know, if, if, a, if another church has a, a predominant culture to it, they'll say, oh yeah, that church over there, that's, the, that's that multicultural church. And even to other people outside, even a multicultural church will have a sort of a predominant cultural climate to it. And uh, Pastor Kilpatrick has a, a cultural climate of his, his upbringing, his life experience. Lendl has a cultural climate uh, in his, his music. It shows up in his music. And then there's all these players uh, in the church, all the musicians and the, the different ministers. They all have, we all have varied levels of ability, you know, and... Some are young, some are older, some are um, more skilled, and some are more skilled in certain areas. And we're all rubbing against each other. And uh, we're, a lot of times, we're frustrated, and we go into worship being frustrated. And people in the choir are frustrated, you know. Someone in the choir feels like they don't get enough attention, or they need to you know, I should get to sing. There's this one song that people really like to hear me sing, and I don't get to, I don't get to sing it. And I used to sing it on Sunday morning, and now, you know, this new worship leader's come along, and I don't get to sing that anymore. And people ask me about that. You know, they, they, they request it, and I don't know why things are like they are anymore. Or I used to get to play, and now I don't get to play. Or I, you know, a lot of times, Lendl tells me specifically what he wants me to play on the bass guitar. He has a specific thing that he wants. Not all the time. A lot of times he'll just let me do anything I like. <clears throat> but a lot of the, the music that I've played in the church over my lifetime has not been music that I've cared for personally. And if I could ever, if I could ever write a book or something, to the, that I think the title of it would be "Everything That I've Ever Learned About God, I've Learned from My Children." 
uh, a while back, I took my kids uh, to a place near here where uh, there's a man that owns some, uh, some quarter horses, some race horses, and uh, there was a girl that was training those horses and she, uh, she told my wife, Hazel, that uh, if we come up, she'd, she'd let the kids see the horse and, and uh, they'd get to ride the horse. And so we drove up there and um, uh, got out of the, the car and we saw this beautiful quarter horse, a race horse, really, a young one. And uh, she took the horse out of the stable and put the horse out in this open corral type area and the horse was just, you know, the hind legs were kicking out and it was rearing up and I thought that is a, that is a beautiful sight to see a horse uh, act like that, behave like that, you know, demonstrate what it's, you know, how magnificent it really is. And uh, a saying came to me that I'd heard a few years ago, a wild horse is of no use to man. And the trainer uh, went into the corral with the bridle and the blanket, you know, and put the bridle on the horse, the blanket and the saddle, and got on the horse and took it out and had this field in the back behind their house, uh, like a sort of a, a practice track. She got on that horse and she just, she opened the horse up some, and we thought, man, that is, that is really a sight to see a, a real live race horse that, uh, it's just a magnificent thing. He came back around, back into the corral area, and she got off, and she said, okay, let, let's let some of the kids ride, and I thought, man, I don't know about that. That's, that's, that could be dangerous, you know. So she took one of my, one of my very small, probably three, four-year-old girls at the time, and put my little girl up on that horse who had just demonstrated incredible power and ability under those other conditions. And my daughter sat on that, sat on that horse, and the uh, trainer took the reins and walked around the, the corral area. I don't know what else to call it. I call it a corral. Is it? Um, and it was like it was a pony ride. And I had just seen that horse in another setting demonstrate something else. Well, that's the, that's the most beautiful picture I had ever seen of meekness. And see, we've got the wrong uh, picture of of meekness when we talk about uh, or, or read about Christ and his meekness you know meekness rhymes with weakness and we tend to think of of weak and uh, uh, you know somebody that's that's timid or shy well that's not it at all that that horse had been meeked by the trainer to be of use to the owner and in the church, we don't belong to ourselves. We're not free to do just anything. We're not here to, to fulfill our, you know, our artistic expression, you know. You've got, your, you've got your bedroom, your house. You've got friends you can get with. You've got, there's other places to do. That's not what the body of Christ is about and what music is about in the church. It's about taking on the humility of Christ, Christ emptied himself, God emptied himself out in a, in a form of meekness. He emptied himself out and lowered himself. You know, that's a, a musician up here, uh, you know, start spouting off to his friends or his peers about what his leader won't let him do and what the pastor won't let him do and why do we have to do this and why do we have to do that. Uh, that's, that's evil. It's evil and dark, and it has no place in the church. And I say that, it comes back to me because I've, I've not always handled that real well myself. But every time I've mishandled that, God has, has uh, chastened me for it. And a lot of people don't know that because 
uh, I believe God chastens his children in secret so that, the, so that the wicked won't rejoice over it. God loves his children. He chastens them. But a lot of times there's people up here going through chastening or reproofs from the Lord and no one else knows about it. It's because God's just so loving, you know. But, but it's just uh, that picture of meekness has meant a lot to me because if we are a racehorse, if there's a racehorse in one of us, then eventually, someday or some moment, the racehorse will come out in us. God will, you know, he'll use it to its fullest capacity. But today, we might be a pony ride. Today, you're a pony ride. Tomorrow, maybe you'll be a racehorse. And the next day, you might be a pony ride again. Um, I was going to add something else to that, but that's, that's really it, Lyndall. Well, that, an that answers one of these questions I was about to ask. I think a lot of these just got answered. Uh, somebody says, how do you make older, the older generation enter the newer styles of worship? You don't make anybody do anything. And you can't convince them. And again, I say, they don't like you. That's the reason they won't enter in with you. Brother Elmer back there at the door. Wave your hand, Brother Elmer. I love that man. And Brother Elmer, as I told you, was a part of praying what God has done. He's been a member of this church for years and years. I know that stylistically and the palette of what Brother Elmer is used to is probably different than who I am. But Brother Elmer will receive ministry from me because I love Brother Elmer and he knows I love him. He knows I put my arm around him and he's my friend. I love Brother Elmer. Now, I ain't going to make Brother Elmer like guitar solos and I'm not going to make Brother Elmer get into a lot of the things that we were doing this week. But I'm not here to make Brother Elmer do that because he's already a man of God. He doesn't need my little whippersnapper ideas. I'm honored that that man would stand with me in prayer. Because, Brother Elmer, I like having you pray for me, brother. I like to know that you're back there praying for me because I couldn't make it without you. And that's what we've got to get to. Benny just said it. It's not about you expressing what you want to do. If your pastor and the leadership allows it, then do it. If they don't, then just shut up and be meek and enjoy it. Amen. I'm going fast now, okay, because we're getting late. Uh, I'm going to try to answer a few. Uh, how can we find new Cooley songs? Um, I think some of the songs that were in your packet we didn't sing, and you're wondering what you're asking is where are they on tape and where's the music to them. Uh, we're in the process of finalizing contracts with Integrity Music. Some of them will be on a new Integrity record we'll do here and other things from MMI. So those will be available soon. Don't quote me on how soon, okay? Okay, that one's done. Uh, how do you handle conflicts and disciplinary, disciplinary issues in the worship team, especially tardiness or absence? Next question. Uh, they're not absent. I'm tardy, okay? Uh, well, understand that there are different there are different giftings, and and uh, if 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 absence and tardiness becomes a a thing that is just out of uncaring, if a person gets an attitude that they don't care, they just show up and they don't care. You know, they just don't care. They're they're being tardy or or absent to prove a point. Uh, I I would dismiss them. I would dismiss them, let them have a little time off. If a person is tardy because they're just tardy by nature, <laughs> I would work with them. But eventually, like my people have learned to forbear me, I really am a late person. I work on it constantly. Nobody's harder on me than me. My pastors pull me aside a time or two, and I correct it. It was bad before I got married. It's worse than since I've got married. It's not my fault, wife's fault. It's just 
I never give myself enough time when I leave. And I think I do. This morning, I left in time, I thought. But then I sat at an, at an intersection, which I have never had to do. I live out in Molino. And I've been warned by Benny that eventually that train would get me. Benny got me this morning. And it stopped. The paper mill train. I didn't know where to go. There's no way around it. You just sit there and just watch six lights change. And you're just going, oh, God, and I've got to start. And a musician watch is working today. And here I have made an effort to be. So, you know, and I know the answer to that is leave another 30 minutes early. And I'm trying, okay? But I'm saying there's a difference in motivation. See, again, I'm being transparent to you. I could stand up here to lie to you and tell you that I've got it all together, but I don't. Do you see what I'm saying? It's about being real and understanding that I have a problem there. Is it because I don't care? No. My wife gets the brunt of most of mine. I apologize, baby, because sometimes we'll get in the car and go, here we go again, late again. My God, can't we be on time? And I just chew her head off all the way to church. And then I get up and go, I love you, Lord. Oh. I so I, 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 go ahead. Speaking of tardy, go ahead, Bill. <laughs> you know how the leadership kind of filters down that... I forgot what I was going to say now. I'm sorry, brother. That was a joke. That was, no, that was not a cut, okay? I love you. Um, one thing I think that, that in that whole area of discipline um, that I've, that I've kind of stumbled on, uh, when, I, when I worked with, uh, I worked, had an opportunity to work with Brother David Wilkerson at Times Square Church in Manhattan. And he had this wonderful uh, concept that he was very pastoral in his staff. He still is, but he very much, he watched, he would, we would start a Sunday service and he would look at everybody in the choir and he would watch his staff. He had such a fatherly, pastoral, loving, caring, even as he, uh, he operated in the, in, operates in the gift of the, pro, the prophetic, and I really consider him more of a prophet, he had such a pastor's heart. And what he would do is that he would take like, say, the head of uh, the children's ministry and he might see that maybe he's kind of hit a wall for, for the last month or two. And uh, he would go up to him, and, and, and he did this to me. Uh, he, he would say, hey, listen, I want you to take a month, a month off. I want you to read these three books. I want you to fast three days a week. I want you to go to church somewhere else and come back in that month and tell me what God's telling you. And I know all of us can't afford that, but, but when we look at discipline and working in our in our worship teams as as a hey we, we you know there there are discipline problems and as you know that spirit of lucifer will rise up in all of us and that needs to be so heavily pastored if we're using people on our worship teams just because they can do something because they can perform a function we're really mishandling our people yeah. and i would suggest that if there is somebody if there is pride if you've got a player in your group that has that you know that they're just there because this is their time to shine and it's more than what it needs to be to them I would just highly suggest that you ask them to sit down for a season, that your concern is for them to grow as a Levite, not as a performer. And I think that a lot of our platforms would clear if we had guys who say, listen, just come and sit in the front row and get a notepad out and take notes for a while. Read this book and let's talk about it. I, want you to, I feel like God's wanting us to grow in prayer or intercession or whatever. You hear what I'm saying? A lot of people are just coming to church because they play. It's almost like a hobby. Yeah, do their gig. They play their gig. But pastor your people. It's just, you got to have so much pouring. I know Lila pours into her people. She can tell you everything. You know, she, she, there's a lot of attention given to you guys. Well, there's a lot of leadership, too, that are black and white. Uh, there, are, there are personality types, again, because I studied personality types. There are certain people who have a stronger bend toward total black and whiteness. It's like, it's this way or the highway. And, and John Kilpatrick is probably the most disciplinary pastor I've ever met. This is a man who would stand up and say, he had, he's notorious around here. 
No wonder we're all afraid of him. No. No, I mean, really, we love him, but, but he stood up one Sunday morning. He said, I want so-and-so and so a couple to stand up. And they stood up, and he said, see these people? They're trouble. Don't eat with them. Don't talk to them. They're out of this church as of today. Now, he's got guts. Now, somebody said, well, that is not the way to pastor. But what you don't understand is for a year or so he'd been working with them, counseling with them, talking with them, confronting them with the elders, dealing with them, trying to mend them back into the kingdom, and they refuse to control their tongue. And then there comes a place where somebody's got to go, you're out, sorry, goodbye. There's the door. And so even though Pastor John has that kind of strength, I still watch him around weaker ones. And he'll pull them in and go, now I understand things aren't going well, but let's, let's talk about it. And he's the one who has taught me Brother Elmer knows this, working with him as long as you have. He's the one who's taught me that when somebody's got something to say that they're upset with, it's good to try to jump on the other side of the table and hear, why are they upset? There may be a good reason why they're upset that you don't see. You're not always right. And I've got people in my choir that are black and white folks. I mean, if, if, if Lisa says be here at 6 o'clock, they're going to be here at 10 till. And, and God forbid anybody in the section that shows up at 6.01, Regardless of the reason, I mean, it's like, like you said that they couldn't be in here unless they got crack, crack, crack. And what people have not understood for years is I am pastoring this thing, and sometimes I have privy to knowledge that no one else knows. I may know that one of my sopranos or one of my altos or one of my musicians may be fighting hell at home. I may be knowing that they're under attack, and I'm going to give them grace. And so I tell the music department, Lisa knows this up front, I am going to treat everybody a little different. I don't treat everybody the same. I love everybody the same, but according to what's going on that I know in their life, that's how I'm going to discipline, and that's how I'm going to deal with them. And guess what? Lindo gets disciplined too. John Kilpatrick calls me on the carpet. I get that ride, that drive in the car. <laughs> May get one after this week. I don't know, but I hope not. So that's how we, as far as conflicts, uh, usually I just put all the girls in one room and let them fight it out. And then it's, <laughs> and somebody arrives as the conqueror, you know, and I just go, so you're the new king. No, I'm, no. Conflicts, again, need to be headed off. I, I'm the most oblivious. A lot of times we'll have problems and I don't know if anything's going on. And it, it's turned into a big mess before I know. And sometimes... Then somebody will tell me, and then I'll, I'll see something. I'll go, oh, this is silly. But I, I learned the best way a lot of times to resolve a conflict is to get the person who's got the problem with the person who's saying that they've got the problem. And sometimes when you get them all in the same room, it comes out, and nothing that's been said by the peripheral people is even true. Yeah. And you get in there and clean it up. And also, if it gets bad enough, I'll pull communion out. That really helps, too. <laughs> really. Really, if I get into a really nasty thing that looks like we're at a stalemate, I'll get the communion elements out. I haven't had to do that here yet, but, but I've done it before. Just pull out the communion elements unless we all need to have communion, you know? And people get hurt at me. This, I think every worship team member has been upset with me at one time or another. And, and, and like I said, most of the time, I had talked with one of them this week. They were hurt at me and, and, and upset with me, and, and I didn't even know. You know, I was just totally sailing right on, not even knowing. Because if I had known I'm the kind of a leader, and, and, and I think they all would agree, I carry them heavy. If I know somebody's hurt at me, I can't get up there and lead worship. If I know that I may have hurt somebody intentionally, it weighs so heavy on me that I can't be free. So I got to, you know, like, if Amber and I get a fight, we're going to clean it up before I get up here. Leave. I can't walk up there and lead worship of a pure heart knowing that I may have done something wrong. Well, and, and so... Lindell, as far as the worship team goes, if, if one of your worship team members has something against the leader and they can't go to them and then they harbor it and harbor it, they have no business singing. Because right. your worship is clogged up. It's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to benefit you and it won't benefit anybody else. That's true. So unless you can, within yourself, take care of it, or go to your leader, then then you don't need to be there. Good. Mendel, 
on the absent side of that, where they're asking about absence, you know, uh, you know the pulse of your worship team. Right. And when we are not here, it is not because we don't want to be here. Right. It is because I have a husband, I have five children. Right. And there are, there are services almost every night. And, yeah, uh, every night. And so when we're not here, it doesn't mean that our hearts are not after God. Well, a good, well, hold on a minute before you go, Hazel. A good instance of that is too, is I try to, I'm not trying to make me a saint, but it's like if I sense that someone has really put out a lot of work and they're starting to fray, like Mike. Mike is a young father and just been on staff. You know, he's got a young baby. How old is Matthew? He's four months old and he's been here every night this week. So I, I, by the way, I handled that. You're off tonight. Uh, Mike is supposed to lead worship on tonight, and then he'll be here tomorrow night. With him. It's like every night this week for eight, nine, ten nights. And I know that he needs a night free. Uh, he has a child. Now, Johnny is the only single one up here right now, but, but he's got a life too. But uh, Hayes. No, you don't. <laughs> he doesn't have a life. Carol. Carol has, Carol is the lady in the white. She has five children. Hazel has eight. Uh, how many do you have? Two. Amber and I have one. Lisa and Bill have two. So these people, go ahead, Hazel, you had an input. Linda, we're tardy too. We just know when you and Bill and Mike and you guys come and we get here five minutes before you and, and we run out here and sit and look like we've been sitting here for 30 minutes. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Which makes us feel awful. I'll be taking phone numbers after this meeting in case, because I want to really resolve this <laughs> single issue. Okay? Just see me after service. I'll be out in the foyer right over there. Okay. I want to, I've only got about 20 more minutes or 25 more minutes. I want to really breeze through some questions because you've asked these and they're good questions. Uh, Lyndall, do you choose all the music or do you allow input from the worship team and intercessors or the pastor? from everybody. Uh, if pastor hears a song somewhere that he loves, his blood washes me. Steve Hill brought that back to me. Pastor's wife is the reason I sing, we will ride. If the intercessors are the, what, Lila has brought me a lot of stuff that, that works in intercession. So yes, okay? Yes, I do. Uh, Lyndall, when you stray away from a planned song list, do you reach for a music book from your stand? And how do the musicians know what key you're playing in? How do I tell them what song? I don't signal very much. Uh, I figure they'll find me eventually. Uh, because again, I got a situation here in musicians that they, they're able to do so. Uh, also, when I'm reaching for a song list, when I stray from my list, I probably 99% of the time don't have a list. Very, very few nights I have a list. It's how I work. It isn't need necessarily how you work. Depends on how long you've been doing this. You know, we don't use overheads, so it's not critical. I, I do want to incorporate overheads eventually. I like them, uh, but for the season of revival we had, they didn't work, and uh, they were they became another thing to be chained to. You know, and, and I know now there's some really good PowerPoint things that can just spur the moment you can find the song. But I sing so many songs, we have no book, we have a no, they're old camp meeting songs that nobody knows. You know, Mike is always being intimidated, going, Little, I don't know, don't leave me here with somebody who's going to pull up a bunch of old stuff I don't know. And, you know, I just know I've got this walking encyclopedia of songs. I could have been a, a, a brilliant chemist with all the songs that I've learned, you know, if I'd applied that knowledge somewhere else. But, but I don't use one. But when I'm reaching for a book sometimes, because I know those books up there so well, and we've used vineyard music so much. Those are all vineyard books. Um, the only reason I have those is those were what we leaned on in the beginning of revival because God was doing something new and requiring me to play different music. So I was only singing Vineyard, and the only way we learned things in the beginning of revival was I'd put on a CD during the day and, and, bring, and bring the book with me to church and play it. And I'd have that little chord chart up there to remember how it went. And so it's a bit of a crutch, 
because sometimes when the Spirit's moving, I'll go, we need to do a song out of that red book, and I don't know which one it is, and I'll grab the book and stumble through it, and I'll go, oh, it's that one, Creation Calls. Yeah, let's do that one. And so I, I use it as a crutch, and I probably eventually will outgrow it. Uh, but that's what's going on there. Um, how long should the worship team practice? Uh, that's something that I appreciate about Lisa and Mike and Brenda, my secretary, that have helped me because before revival, I tried to come prepared. When I first started doing choir rehearsals at Brownsville, I always had my music down. I always brought it ready. I knew what I was going to rehearse when revival took place. Plus, I have an international ministry that has eight employees separate from Brownsville. And then I'm traveling and doing all these other things. So there's no way I could keep up with everything. So they help me with that. But we try to come into a rehearsal because I honor people's time. Qu choir members and worship team people's time is very important. And they, you need to have the rehearsal stuff together. Uh, a lot of people need to rehearse, on, learn how to rehearse. You know, get it done, get out of there. Uh, Bill would spend more time in prayer than I would, but my personal opinion is if you're going to pray, come an hour early or decide up front you're going to pray an hour before you rehearse. But whatever rehearsal time is rehearsal time, let's rehearse. I don't want to pray and prophesy during rehearsal time. That's my personal opinion. But if, but on the con contrary to that is there's been rehearsals before that I've come in with a word from the Lord and we've, we've just shut the rehearsal down. It's open, but just be ready because the people are volunteering and they've got families and homes and other things to do besides be there and be at that rehearsal if you don't know what you're doing. So get your act together before you come, okay? Uh, I'm going fast. Hey, I want to ask this one. To, this is a good open question. And I, I don't have the answer to this. Lila, musicians, Bill, all of you. How would you explain prophesying on your instrument? See y'all later. <laughs> Can I sort of um, approach that quick? Because I don't believe that we have the full understanding of that yet. Something that I have experienced and have learned in intercession, that there are certain groups or certain musicians, certain worship people that have a touch of the glory in their music. And I discovered it totally by accident, as I have most of stuff, you know. And that was, uh, I started saying, God's in the music. There's something in that music. Well, now we've learned, you know, that God's in the videos and all of that. But this was kind of a new experience for me. And I discovered that there were certain types of music, certain artists, certain, when they would hit a certain place, that it would draw people into intercession and into intimacy with God. And then I learned later on that there's an artist that wrote a, wrote a song called God is in the music. And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, that's what I've been sensing. So I don't know if that's prophecy. I don't know if that's uh, a, a precursor to where we're going to go in this. I, I think we're just barely now scratching the surface of where the, uh, the old covenant people went, the Davidic uh, uh, intercessors and, and, and worshipers went. After all, they had 24 hours a day. You know, and they had seven days a week, 365 uh, uh, days out of the year. Also, as I understand, they had years of training before they were ever released to be able to, to uh, come together. So in those times, they learned things that we don't know. I mean, we're just putting it together, starting to try to humbly put it together now. I, I think we're going to see something really powerful. I, I believe we, we touched a little bit of it this yes. week. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I when thought that night the flowing Bill. together with you and, and Jesse and, and, and Bill, I think, is, that, is that what you're talking about? Well, there was two times I, I felt that, that an instrument was prophesying in this meeting. And uh, I would say one of them was the first night on Sunday night. I worship, see, I love explaining because it opens up understanding. I, I was worship, worshiping, I let a few songs off, and I kind of hit a wall. And I backed off, and Bill came up, and Bill didn't say anything. He just started playing. And did you notice how it broke loose? And to me, that, that felt like he was prophesying on that instrument. It's, and the, all the musicians just fell into it together succinctly. It's just like, it's like God was doing something. And then uh, there was one night where Scott hit a cadence that it felt like there was spirit behind it. There are times, now last night when we hit that cadence, it wasn't there. It wasn't the same. 
You know, we tried it. I felt like at the close of service on Monday night when I pulled that little drum out there and I was hitting, I, th I felt there was something spiritual happening. And I felt there was a, it was a prophetic thing of Mark. And let me tell you what I say about prof prophecy. Prophecy is a foretelling or a forward moving. And here's what, let me tell you what the Lord's speaking to me right now. This is fresh off my head. I don't know if, I don't know if we'll write a book about it. Uh, we're not going to sell this tape. Audio folks, this tape will not be sold. So this is, you're all getting it, nobody else will. I believe that a large amount of prophecy as we've known has been hidden in the music. Uh, I believe that the church rejected prophecy and intercession. The, the mainstream, like we talked about yesterday, the denominations rejected it in the 40s and the 50s and God's bringing them around one more time to give them an opportunity to say, yes, Lord, we'll go with that. Uh, prophetically, I feel like that music is prophetic in the sense that it pushes the people forward. In the Old Testament, the, the music was always out front of battle. It always sounded a certain sound that told the people to go forward. Now, who was the guy in the Bible, the instance where the musicians and, and made such a clamor and a noise that the enemy turned on themselves? Now, who was that? Jehoshaphat's group Jehoshaphat. went out there dancing and so on. But if you remember when the kings were inquiring of the Lord what to do when they were in battle, right. they would call for the musicians. That's right. And it would release the prophetic. That's right. And uh, that happened on more than one occasion. I think Elisha did it and also Jehoshaphat. And then God gave them the strategy and then he actually used the music and the, and the release of that uh, to, uh, to confuse the enemy. In fact, in that particular battle with Jehoshaphat, not one person was lost in Israel. Now, my question would be, they were beset about with all these enemies, no way that they could succeed. Right. What kind of an anointing did those musicians and those singers have upon them to, to be able to, you know, to get themselves to the place where they would march out there in the face of, of, of enemies that obviously in the natural could not be defeated? And when you take that out of the spirit, you talk about early years, late 1800s, early 1900s of Britain in the 1800s. Britain and some of the other armies would always have a drum corps. Yeah. Why did they use a drum corps? The drum corps had two purposes. One was to set a cadence of march, but the other opportunity and hope was that the enemy would hear the drums and be intimidated that it was a much larger number than what it actually was. And so I feel personally, and, and I'll say this to, I say, I, I speak to Scott and Glenn and, and, and Benny and some of these, these guys play professionally. Uh, they live in Nashville. And we don't curse Nashville. There's a lot of good things happening there. There's a lot of good things happening. Uh, a couple of us have a bit of cynicism concerning Christian contemporary music industry. Not the artists, but the industry it's become. Uh, but I want to say something to you all that, that I've pondered since I was 19 years old. I've always wondered what would happen if we could grab about five or six guys who love the Lord with all their heart, young musicians, and we could shelter them from outside influence and teach them the ways of the Lord, to seek the Lord, to fast, to pray, and let their life revol resolve, revolve centrally around 40 hours a week of just spending time with the Lord and writing what He was giving them. Now that sounds fantastic to us now that that would be. But I've always wondered what would that music sound like that they would play if they didn't listen to Jimi Hendrix? If they did, and I'm not, you know what I'm saying? Because most all of us have influence. I was influenced by R&B. Aretha Franklin, Billy Preston, all those great musicians that, that really most of them were backslidden from the church. And I allowed a backslidden person who was not walking with the Lord to influence me because of the gift that God had put there but it also had been a gift that had been perverted. Do you see what I mean? So most of us, honestly, have been influenced by a perverted gift. The gift was pure from the Lord, but it was used for not a godly purpose. I've always had a hankering in my heart to wonder what would happen if young musicians, if there were a way to shelter them in the presence of God 
and nurture them in this kind of a revival fire atmosphere and let the Holy Spirit teach them. Again, I'm getting back to folks going, do you really believe the Bible? Do you believe that he's the spirit of truth and that he leads us and guides us in the ways of all truth? Do we really believe that God is the creator? Do we really believe that he created every note of music that's ever been played? And if he is as immense as we all say he is, then wouldn't it stand to reason that he has more than what he's given us? Well, there's only so many notes in the scale and ways it can be played. Is that so? Do you understand what I'm saying? I sound metaphoric and I sound weird, I know. I'm not trying to be weird. I'm just posing that question to cause your brain to think in a different way. And I guess I hunger for that. And I know that maybe I'm not the man to do that. But I'm wondering if maybe some of us are the people to raise those kids up and, and father that just as David wasn't the man to build the temple, but he fathered the man who built the temple. Do you see what I'm saying? And I'm wondering if, boy, I got off into something here, didn't I? But I'm wondering if that is where our prophet is laying dormant. And I'm wondering that if that music could be heard, do you see how corrupt, oh, forgive me for going off. Okay, can I have just a minute? And I, I've taken one, but I, do you see how corrupt we have become? Do you see how much like the world and its influences we have become intoxicated on? How many young musicians, and this is not wrong of you, but how many of you come up to me and go, I need to figure out a way to get my new CD heard? Well, that, I understand why you're saying that. You feel like God has given you the songs. You need to get them out. But what if your CD, what if you weren't concerned about that, but mostly you were concerned about ministering unto the Lord, and then maybe someone else come by and hear that and go, you know what? We need to put that on a CD and let that be heard. And your attitude was of such purity that went, you know, if you want to record it, it's okay. I don't care to hear it. I don't care to know how much it's sold. That's not my job. My job is to minister to before the Lord. And I'm wanting to please His presence. What kind of power would that have? What could happen? Because I want to tell you something. I believe that we have so been influenced by the world of darkness. And I believe that Satan has so weighed on our minds, church that what is normal seems abnormal to us. And the spirit world, if somebody starts talking about the spirit world being bigger, C.S. Lewis was one of my favorite writers, and he's a brilliant man. But even C.S. Lewis himself says, the world that we cannot see. Now you think he was an intellectual, smart man? He was an agnostic, but he came to the Lord? C.S. Lewis says the world we can't see is really the real world. What we can see and touch is not even real. This is all a dream. What we can't see is what's real. And so I'm just saying, I'm not trying to open you up to weirdness, please. I, I, I could get in a lot of trouble for saying these kind of things. But it's in my heart. And I just ask God how long until he releases it. I want it so bad. I want to see pure worship so bad that has no fleshly and I know there's a certain amount of flesh that's always going to be tamed until Jesus comes I know that but there's a striving in me somewhere that just makes me want it so bad and I don't know how to get it I don't know how to get there and I've made a feeble step with this conference we've made a I think we've made a little step just to move inch just a few centimeters forward but I feel like there's so much more there's so much more Hallelujah. I know I'll be branded weird for that, but I'm sorry. I just can't help it. Let me hurry. Ah, a few more minutes. Anything y'all want to say to my weirdness? Go ahead, Hazel. This wasn't about the weariness necessarily, but what you were talking about a while ago when you were asking about the prophesying on the instruments. When we're in here, and, and I feel like I'm a worship leader in a, short, in a sense, I'm trying to lead people into worship. That's my goal and my purpose. 
not to be a great singer. I'm a mediocre singer, and I'm okay with that, and I should strive to do my best. But I'm going to never be some great singer, and there's nothing wrong with being great singers, but I am a worshiper. And when we're worshiping the Lord together in unity, and when that band and when when Bill either hits that keyboard or when Scott goes into whatever that whenever that breaking happens it's the same thing that happened when Lyndall hands me the banner and says I'm giving you the glory yeah. it did something in my spirit man it took me out of myself opened up my spirit and all of a sudden we're in the presence of God and I'm hearing God I'm seeing things when I go and pray for people, I can see things, and I hear him. It's like, God, what do you want? I'll start declaring it. And it happens whenever we're worshiping like that, and that keyboard or whatever happens at that moment. It may be different at different times because there's different things going on all the time, and I feel like I get up in that place, and God is showing me the strategy of the enemy, and I can yell at it and make it, I mean, not from me, but it's coming from the spirit that opens up when that happens. And that, that I just wanted to add to that when you were talking about the prophesying, I feel like that. Now, Scott and Lynn have airplanes to catch, and whenever y'all need to go, you're free to go. Whatever you need to do, we bless you and thank you for coming. We love you. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I don't want to hold you. Yeah. And before you go, we want to pray for you. I, I just feel like there's lots of other questions. Uh, I, I, how many would like to have prayer before you leave today? Now, if you don't want it, it's okay. We're happy to not have to pray for all 800 of you. But those of you who would like prayer, uh, I think the way to end this conference is just uh, now, I, again, I'm not a manipulator. I'm not going to work something up. We'll probably put that Spirit of the Sovereign Lord CD in back there, and, and, and it'll be lay, low key. And I, I'm just going to lay hands on you. I'm going to ask my worship team members and Lila and all of us. We are so exhausted, we can't work much, but we trust that God will do the work. And we're just going to ask God to touch you, those of you who want. Uh, you had your hand up, sir. The audio tape of, will become available uh, uh, this morning. You mean of today's? Uh, they're what? Okay, there are videotapes that are running live. So they should be available in the bookstore. Okay. Okay. Yes, we're saying that, yes, it's available in the bookstore as soon as we conclude. Are you leaving, Scott? Could we pray for these guys before they leave? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Bill, just lay hands on them over there. Let's all stretch our hands that way because they've got to get their stuff. Intercessors, you want to come up and help? Thank you, Lord. 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 Father, I thank you and bless you for these brothers, Lord. I ask you, Lord, to give them safe traveling. Father, I ask you to let a new anointing rest upon them and a new hunger for you. Just fill them up with your presence and your spirit, O oh Lord. Fill them up with your presence and your spirit, Father. Release their souls, Lord, to worship you in a new way. Amen. Come on, just lift your voice and pray for them, all right? They're absolutely on a mission field of sorts in Nashville, and we just ask God to just touch them and bless them in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Touch them, Lord, with your presence, Lord. Keep them safe. Touch their families. Fresh touch of Jesus on them. Do it, Lord. Bless them for their work. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Before we pray 
for everyone. There is a, there are a couple of pertinent questions that I really feel bad that we didn't answer. And uh, one of them is, how do I deal with an intercessor who's part of the worship team? And they manifest. I ask all the intercessors, except in meetings like this week and on Thursday nights in my choir, when they start manifesting strongly, because again, we're, we had a preconditioned audience here. We all had sat and prepared ourselves for this, so you were not weirded out by anything happening. But on a Sunday morning, folks coming in who have no idea what we're up to, if one of my worship team members or my intercessors or my choir members just go off while nobody else is going off, if everybody's going off or, and there's a release of it in the room, Hazel has been a part of that before where she would go off and it just catch fire, that's fine. But if we're, it talks about here in an intimate time of worship, um, if you can't control yourself, just step aside and go behind the stage. It's not to hide you or be ashamed of you. It's just God may have something on you to pray. We don't want to stop you from praying, but we also don't want everybody to stop worshiping to watch you, okay? Uh, so that's good. Um, is it possible that the thing you don't want to do in most in ministry is what God called you to do? And 100%. Matter of fact, if you're seeking the will of God and you've got two options, the one you want the least is God's will. Okay? That, that's pretty straight ahead. Um, I would almost guarantee that. Uh, you don't have to play a musical instrument to lead worship. Uh, you, but you'll need somebody to help you. Uh, why do they cage the drummer? Because they're animals. <laughs> we cage the drummer because the choir mics pick up the drums and all you can hear is drums. Uh, I would prefer you cage them than buy electronic drums. Those things are from the devil. Because uh, a young, a young, a young drummer, do you agree with that? Young drummers cannot learn how to play an instrument. Uh, uh, drums are an instrument to be played with the right timbre, and you can't learn how to strike it as a musical instrument and play with feeling and emotion when you're hitting a plastic pad. It just isn't the same. A great drummer like Scott or people like that could could do it, and it wouldn't affect them. But a young drummer who's learning, he needs to learn on real drums to learn his instrument. So if you need to cage him in because he's so loud, all you hear is the snare, then do that. That's good. Okay, I think I've... What do you do if a member of your team was addicted to pornography? And what if they were in a secular band? If they were and they're delivered, praise God. If they've got it now, we need to get them out of there. Uh, how do you help people enter in? Uh, I just engage myself and hope they'll follow. There's times I can't get people to enter in. And, and one thing I want to tell you too is um, when, you, when you come to worship, engage yourself and people will usually follow you, but sometimes God don't show up. And that's the final thing I want to address. When you're there to worship and God just doesn't show up, or when you intercede and there's not a connection, you getting a feeling or a doodad or a, or a confirmation is not what, what you're doing is about. I'm not here to worship so we'll all enter in and we'll all feel good. I'm not here to intercede so that we'll all feel like the work was done. Matter of fact, 90% of intercession is interceding for something that you hope will happen, but you never see an evidence of it. You know, there's a small amount of actual seeing. It's a forerunning, and it's the same with music. Sometimes people enter in and we have a bus loose situation. Other times, we worship the Lord because He's worthy, because He's so good, because He's His name is to be exalted. And I don't feel it a lot of times, but I'm gonna give 100% whether I feel or not. God bless you. You've been awesome this week. You've been awesome.